Good morning, Grade Sixes, and welcome to Worksheet Cloud, Grade Six Natural Sciences. For those of you who haven't met, met me yet, my name is Mrs. Hall, and I'm so enjoying taking you on this journey of learning about natural sciences during the lockdown. If you have a question during this lesson, please send an email with your question to grade six at worksheetcloud.com. Let's get on with today's lesson. Today's lesson is on food chains and food webs, and we are going to take a look at a basic food chain, a more in-depth food web, traffic levels, as well as threats. The key questions that you are going to be able to answer at the, answer at the end of today's lesson would be, what are food chains and food webs, and how do they work? And why is it important to ensure a balance between the different components of the ecosystem? Let's get started. First of all, a little bit of revision from yesterday. I want you to look at the picture and I want you to create a list of all the biotic and abiotic features of this picture. I'm going to give you a minute. I hope you can all remember what a biotic and an abiotic factor are. If you were focused yesterday, you would be able to answer this question with ease. Right. The biotic factors are the living organisms in this picture. So it would be the birds, the crocodile in the background, the plants that are growing in the background as well. The abiotic factors are the non-living features in this picture. It would be things like the water, the soil, the temperature, the amount of sunlight coming into the ecosystem. Those would be considered non-living. Remember, the living and non-living factors rely on each other in order to survive. Let's take a look at a simple food chain. A plant is eaten by a caterpillar. The caterpillar is eaten by a bird and the bird is in turn eaten by a fox. Food chains always start with a plant that is eaten by an animal. The chains usually have about three to five species. I want you to quickly write down another simple food chain that you can think of, just quickly. Perhaps Jump up, look out the window, look outside in your garden and see what you can see in your garden and make up a quick, simple food chain using about three to five species. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. Right. Here's an example of a basic food chain. Hopefully this one wasn't in your garden though. Food chains show which organisms eat other organisms. So we'll start with the grass, which you probably all have, eaten by the rabbit. Some of you might have the rabbit eaten by the fox, which I don't think any of you have. The arrows show the transfer of energy from one organism to the next. So who gets the energy? The rabbit is getting the energy from the grass and that is why the arrow is pointing towards the rabbit. The fox is getting the energy from the rabbit and that is why the arrow is pointing to the fox. The arrow shows who the energy is being transferred to. Right, within a food chain or a food web, we have our living things. We have our producers. They are able to produce their own food through the process of photosynthesis, which you have learned about already in a lot of detail. Consumers, they eat other animals or plants. And decomposers, they eat the dead animals or the dead plants. There are three groups of consumers, according to what they eat. We have a herbivore, which only eats plants. Think of herbs, greens, only eat plants. 
carnivores, think of carn, meaning meat, only animals eat other animals. They are carnivores. Omnivores eat both plants and animals. Those are simple terms that you would have already learned in grade five. Just a little bit of recap for you here. Decomposers are things like your worms and your bacteria, and they feed on the dead bodies of animals and plants, and they are called decomposers, your worms and your bacteria. Remember, we did in food processing, we spoke about the different microbes. We got the good ones and the bad ones. These ones would probably be good ones, breaking down the plant and animal matter. Right, grade sixes, in science, we have scientific terminology. It's part of the language that is used by scientists in their professional activities. While studying nature, scientists often encounter or create new material or objects and concepts, and they name them. Let's take a look at the scientific terms for this section. It's always important. You need to remember that science is a whole new language on its own. Producers. Producers are organisms which can make their own energy from carbon dioxide and water using sunlight for energy. Those are your plants and they make their own food through the process of photosynthesis. Your primary consumer are your organisms which eat your producers. They are your herbivores. Your secondary consumers are organisms which eat primary consumers. They are your carnivores. <clears throat> your tertiary consumers are your organisms which eat your secondary consumers and they are also your carnivores. So this might be some new language to you, secondary and tertiary consumers. Microorganisms are very tiny organisms such as bacteria and fungi. Decomposers are microorganisms that break down dead plants and animals. They also break down the waste easy way to say, the poop of other organisms. Decomposers are very important for any ecosystem. If they weren't in the ecosystem, the plants would not get the essential nutrients and dead matter and waste would pile up. And we don't want that happening. We need it to be broken down and returned back to the soil. Over here, just a good visual for you of our microorganisms over here and our decomposers in the soil here. You know, they actually say that in the soil there are more bacteria and organisms than what there are humans in the world. Interesting. Each level of a food chain is known as a trophic level. Food chains always start with a producer, your plants. Producers are always on the first trophic level. And here we have the different trophic levels. Take a good look at this picture. I'm just going to have another sip of water. Right, each level of the food chain is known as a trophic level. If you look down here at the bottom, we have our producer. It is our first trophic level, and our example here would be an oak tree. Our primary consumer would be the bark beetle, and that would be our second trophic level. Our secondary consumer would be the wood mouse, and that would be our third trophic level. Our tertiary consumer here would be the barn owl, and that would be our fourth trophic level. Again, Look at the arrows. They are pointing to who the energy is being transferred to. The oak tree is your producer. Let me just get my arrow down here. Right. And the energy from the oak tree is transferred to the bark beetle, the herbivore, 
the bark beetle transfers its energy to the wood mouse when the wood mouse eats it and the wood mouse transfers all transfers all of its energy to the barn owl when it gets eaten by the barn owl right this is such a lovely example of a food web you all know these characters but some of the pictures you might not recognize over here we have algae and over here we have zooplankton right here we have little small invertebrates those are little animals without a backbone and we have the characters from finding nemo there's nemo he's a clownfish and um, dory who is a blue regal i can't remember the turtle's name and obviously we have our lovely shark over there right let's take a look at this food web in a more scientific manner right i want you to first of all look at the food web in front of you the scientific diagram and i want you to write down two food chains from this food web two simple food chains remembering it takes three to five species jot it down quickly or think about it look at your producers remember a plant a uh, food web always starts with a, a, a producer like a plant so it would all start with algae and a simple food chain here would be the algae being eaten by the small invertebrates who would be eaten by the blue regal or the algae being eaten by the zooplankton the zooplankton being eaten by the clownfish that would be an example of two little food chains now lots of different food chains make up a food web right look at these questions what will happen to the number of clownfish if the sharks become vegetarians so here we have our great white shark and they become vegetarians so they're not going to eat meat they're not going to eat nemo over here the clownfish what do you think would happen to the number of clownfish if that was to happen yes you're quite right if the sharks became vegetarians there would be too many clownfish and what would happen to the zooplankton there would be too much competition to eat the zooplankton because the clownfish would grow in numbers and their population would increase because no one was eating them so you have to make sure there is always a balance in a food web the right amount of different organisms they have to be in equilibrium what effect will this have on the number of zooplankton so now the great white shark becomes a vegetarian so obviously they're not eating Nemo, who's the clownfish, right? So Nemo, um, just on a second here. Sorry, I'm back. I was just um, battling to see this more writing without my glasses on. So back to the question, what effect will this have on the number of zooplankton? So if the great white shark become vegetarians, they're not eating the clownfish. So there's a huge amount of clownfish and they're all going to be competing for the zooplankton. The zooplankton will decrease in numbers exponentially because obviously there's more clownfish eating them. And then what will happen to the blue regal fish, to Dory, if a disease wipes out the small invertebrates? Well, if the small invertebrates are taken out of this food web, then all the blue regals will be competing with each other for the algae. And there won't be enough food for everybody. The food web is a series of food chains, all connected to each other. Plants are eaten by a variety of consumer animals. And, they, and then those animals may be eaten by a variety of different carnivores so over here another scientific diagram put it into detail for you of a number of different smaller food chains that are all connected to each other making up this food web starting off with our producers to our primary consumers 
our secondary consumers, our tertiary consumers, and they are all linked and some of them eat each other from other food chains. Like if you look over here, the grass and the grass seeds are eaten by the ant. The ant is eaten by the woodpecker. It's also eaten by the lizard and also eaten by the ant eater. So they are all linked. Different threats to a food web. There are lots of things that threaten a food web. How many can you think of? I'm going to give you a minute. Jump up and down, stretch while you can. Have a little bit of a drink of water or a little snack. And I want you to think about all of the things that threaten a food web. Right. The biggest threat of all is us. Yes, you and me. Logging, mining, farming and construction work often involve clearing out natural vegetation for urban development. For example, clearing out a piece of forest for timber, for the wood, can expose the upper layers of the soil to the sun's heat and this in turn causes erosion and drying out of the land. It can cause a lot of animals and insects that depended on the shade and the moisture from the trees to die or migrate to other places. That means leave that specific um, ecosystem and go find somewhere else to live. Climate change is another huge threat to ecosystems as well as global warming. The present rate of rising global temperatures is destroying and altering the coral reefs, our mountain regions, our water cycles, all which are vital ecosystem resources. And I put in these pictures here because you all know what's happening in the North Pole, the Arctic, with the polar bears. If you feel like you need a bit of an extension to this lesson, do a bit of research after this on global warming and climate change and the threat to the polar bears. Very interesting to do that research and find out a bit more about it. Question time, grade six. Are you ready? Let's think about food, food webs in more depth now. From what you've learned today, let's dig deep and think about what we've learned and what we've understood. Answer the following questions for me. Question number one. Why is it important to ensure a balance between the different components of an ecosystem? Think about it. I'm going to give you a second. Ecosystems are all about equilibrium. When something is in equilibrium, it's in balance. This means that the population of various animals in the ecosystem are generally, generally staying within a similar range. Populations can go up and down in cycles as long as there isn't a general upwards growth or downwards trend like I explained to you in the Finding Nemo food web. Without a proper balance, an ecosystem can collapse. It has to be in equilibrium. It has to be in balance. Here's a challenge question. What component of an ecosystem is the most important and why? And I put this little help sign up why? Because this is a time in class where you would all put up your hands and we would have a discussion and we would come up with the best possible answer. So if everybody would give different ideas and their input and then we would say, OK, what do we think the most important component of the ecosystem is and why? And I bet you, you all have your hands up. <laughs> I do miss seeing that grade sixes. Right, let's take a look. The primary producers. I hope you all got this right. 
Why are the pr primary producers the most important? They get their energy directly from the sun. Primary producers are important to the whole food chain because they are the original source of energy that is then passed between other organisms. The next three trophic levels contain organisms known as consumers. And without those producers, there would be no food chain. Great sixes, thank you for watching this lesson again today. I would like to remind you to go on and download the activity sheets I've put up for you. Remember yesterday I did mention to you that um, the worksheet or the activity I put up, you had to wait for today's lesson to answer all of the questions. Now today's activity is also going to have questions from yesterday's lesson. So I hope you enjoy the activity pages and please try and do them on your own before looking at the memo. I know it's so easy to just start reading that memo, but it's better to just extend yourself a little bit and push yourselves a little bit. Have a good afternoon and be kind to each other. See you tomorrow, same time, same place.